to the man who loves art for its own sake, remarked Sherlock Holmes, tossing aside the advertisement sheet of the Daily Telegraph, it is frequently in its least important and lowliest manifestations that the keenest pleasure is to be derived. It is pleasant to me to observe, Watson, that you have so far grasped this truth that in these little records of our cases which you have been good enough to draw up, and I am bound to say occasionally to embellish, you have given prominence not so much to the many cause célèbre and sensational trials in which I have figured, but rather to those incidents which may have been trivial in themselves, but which have given room for those faculties of deduction and of logic syntheses which I have made my special province. And yet, said I, smiling, I cannot quite hold myself absolved from the charge of sensationalism which has been urged against my records. You have erred, perhaps, he observed, taking up a glowing cinder with the tongs and lighting it with the long cherry-wood pipe, which was wont to replace his clay when he was in a disputatious rather than meditative mood. You have erred, perhaps, in attempting to put colour and life into each of your statements, instead of confining yourself to the task of placing upon record that severe reasoning from cause to effect, which is really the only notable feature about the thing. It seems to me that I have done you full justice in the matter, I remarked with some coldness, for I was repelled by the egotism which I had more than once observed to be a strong factor in my friend's singular character. No, it is not selfishness or conceit, said he, answering, as was his wont, my thoughts rather than my words. If I claim full justice for my art, it is because it is an impersonal thing, a thing beyond myself. Crime is common. Logic is rare. Therefore it is upon the logic, rather than upon the crime, that you should dwell. You have degraded what should have been a course of lectures into a series of tales. It was a cold morning of the early spring, and we sat after breakfast on either side of a cheery fire in the old room in Baker Street. A thick fog rolled down before the lines of dun-coloured houses, and the opposing windows loomed like dark, shapeless blurs through the heavy yellow wreaths. Our gas was lit, and shone on the white cloth and glimmer of china and metal, for the table had not been cleared yet. Sherlock Holmes had been silent all the morning, dipping continuously into the advertisement columns of a succession of papers, until at last, having apparently given up his search, he had emerged in no very sweet temper to lecture me upon my literary shortcomings. At the same time, he remarked, after a pause, during which he had sat puffing at his long pipe and gazing down into the fire, you can hardly be open to a charge of sensationalism, for out of these cases which you have been so kind as to interest yourself in, a fair proportion do not treat of crime in its legal sense at all. The small matter in which I endeavoured to help the King of Bohemia, the single experience of Miss Mary Sutherland, the problem connected with the man with the twisted lip, and the incident of the noble bachelor were all matters which are outside the pale of the law. But in avoiding the sensational, I fear that you may have bordered on the trivial. The end may have been so, I answered, but the methods I hold to have been novel and of interest. For sure, my dear fellow, what do the public, the great unobservant public, who could hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? But, indeed, if you are trivial, I cannot blame you, for the days of the great cases are past. Man, or at least criminal man, has lost all enterprise and originality. As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. I think that I have touched bottom at last, however. This note I had this morning marks my zero point, I fancy. Read it. He tossed a crumpled letter across to me.
It was dated from Montague Place upon the preceding evening and ran thus. Dear Mr. Holmes, I am very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or should not accept a situation which has been offered to me as governess. I shall call at half-past ten tomorrow if I do not inconvenience you. Yours faithfully, Violet Hunter. Do you know the young lady? I asked. Not I. It is half-past ten now. Yes, and I have no doubt that is her ring. It may turn out to be of more interest than you think. You remember that the affair of the blue carbuncle, which appeared to be a mere whim at first, developed into a serious investigation. It may be so in this case also. Well, let us hope so. But our doubts will very soon be solved, for here, unless I am much mistaken, is the person in question. As he spoke, the door opened, and a young lady entered the room. She was plainly but neatly dressed, with a bright, quick face, freckled like a plover's egg, and with the brisk manner of a woman who has had her own way to make in the world. "'You will excuse my troubling you, I am sure,' said she as my companion rose to greet her, "'but I have had a very strange experience, and as I have no parents or relations of any sort from whom I could ask advice, I thought perhaps that you would be kind enough to tell me what I should do. Pray take a seat, Miss Hunter. I shall be happy to do anything that I can to serve you. I could see that Holmes was favourably impressed by the manner and speech of his new client. He looked her over in his searching fashion, and then composed himself with his lids drooping and his fingertips together to listen to her story. I have been a governess for five years, said she in the family of Colonel Spence Munro. But two months ago the Colonel received an appointment at Halifax in Nova Scotia, and took his children over to America with him, so that I found myself without a situation. I advertised, and I answered advertisements, but without success. At last the little money which I had saved began to run short, and I was at my wit's end as to what I should do. There is a well-known agency for governesses in the West End called Westerways. And there I used to call about once a week, in order to see whether anything had turned up which might suit me. Westerway was the name of the founder of the business, but it was really managed by Miss Stoper. She sits in her own little office, and the ladies who are seeking employment wait in an ante-room, and are then shown in one by one when she consults her ledgers, and sees whether she has anything which would suit them. Well, when I called last week, I was shown into the little office as usual, but I found that Miss Stoper was not alone. A prodigiously stout man, with a very smiling face and a great heavy chin, which rolled down in fold upon fold over his throat, sat at her elbow, with a pair of glasses on his nose, looking very earnestly at the ladies who entered. As I came in, he gave quite a jump in his chair, and turned quickly to Miss Stoper. "'That will do,' said he. "'I could not ask for anything better.' "'Capital! Capital!' He seemed quite enthusiastic, and rubbed his hands together in the most genial fashion. He was such a comfortable-looking man that it was quite a pleasure to look at him. "'The Copper Beaches, five miles on the far side of Winchester.' It is the most lovely country, my dear young lady, and the dearest old country house. And my duties, sir? I should be glad to know what they would be. One child, one dear little romper, just six years old. Oh, if you could see him killing cockroaches with a slipper, smack, 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 three gone before you could wink. He leaned back in his chair and laughed his eyes into his head again. I was a little startled at the nature of the child's amusement, but the father's laughter made me think that perhaps he was joking. My sole duties, then, I asked, are to take charge of a single child. No, no, not the soul, not the soul, my dear young lady, he cried. Your duty would be, as I'm sure your good sense would suggest, to obey any little commands which my wife might give provided always that they were such commands as a lady might with propriety obey. You see no difficulty, eh? I should be happy to make myself useful. Quite so. In dress, now, for example, 
We are faddy people, you know, faddy but kind-hearted. If you were asked to wear any dress which we might give you, you would not object to our little whim? Eh? No, said I, considerably astonished at his words. Or to sit here, or to sit there, that would not be offensive to you? Oh, no, or to cut your hair quite short before you come to us. I could hardly believe my ears. As you may observe, Mr. Holmes, my hair is somewhat luxuriant, and of a rather peculiar tint of chestnut. It has been considered artistic. I could not dream of sacrificing it in this off-hand fashion. I am afraid that that is quite impossible, said I. He had been watching me eagerly out of his small eyes, and I could see a shadow pass over his face as I spoke. I am afraid that it is quite essential, said he. It is a little fancy of my wife's. And ladies' fancies, you know, madam, ladies' fancies must be consulted. And so you won't cut your hair? No, sir, I really could not, I answered firmly. Ah, very well, then that quite settles the matter. It is a pity, because in other respects you would really have done very nicely. My wife is very anxious that you should come for she has been much attracted by my description of you. We are willing to give thirty pounds a quarter, or one hundred and twenty pounds a year, so as to recompense you for any little inconvenience which our fads may cause you. They are not very exacting, after all. My wife is fond of a particular shade of electric blue, and would like you to wear such a dress indoors in the morning. You need not, however, go to the expense of purchasing one, as we have one belonging to my dear daughter Alice, which would, I think, fit you very well. Then, as to sitting here or there, or amusing yourself in any manner indicated, that need cause you no inconvenience. As regards your hair, it is no doubt a pity, especially as I could not help remarking its beauty during our short interview but I am afraid that I must remain firm upon this point, and I only hope that the increased salary may recompense you for the loss. Your duties, as far as the child is concerned, are very light. Now do try to come, and I shall meet you with the dog-cart at Winchester. Let me know your train. Yours faithfully, Jeffro Rucastle. That is the letter which I have just received, Mr. Holmes, and my mind is made up that I will accept it. I thought, however, that before taking the final step, I should like to submit the whole matter to your consideration. Well, Miss Hunter, if your mind is made up, that settles the question, said Holmes, smiling. But you would not advise me to refuse. I confess that it is not the situation which I should like to see a sister of mine apply for. What is the meaning of it all, Mr. Holmes? Ah, I have no data. I cannot tell. Perhaps you yourself formed some opinion. Well, there seems to me to be only one possible solution. Mr. Rucastle seemed to be a very kind, good-natured man. Is it not possible that his wife is a lunatic, that he desires to keep the matter quiet, for fear she should be taken to an asylum, and that he humours her fancies in every way in order to prevent an outbreak? That is a possible solution. In fact, as matters stand, it is the most probable one. But in any case, it does not seem to be a nice household for a young lady. But the money, Mr. Holmes, the money. Well, yes, of course, the pay is good. Too good. That is what makes me uneasy. Why should they give you £120 a year when they could have their pick for £40? There must be some strong reason behind. I thought that if I told you the circumstances, you would understand afterwards if I wanted your help. I should feel so much stronger if I felt that you were at the back of me. Oh, you may carry that feeling away with you. I assure you that your little problem promises to be the most interesting which has come my way for some months. There is something distinctly novel about some of the features. If you should find yourself in doubt or in danger... Danger? What danger do you foresee? Holmes shook his head gravely. The unusual salary. 
the curious conditions, the light duties, all pointed to something abnormal, though whether a fad or a plot, or whether the man were a philanthropist or a villain, it was quite beyond my powers to determine. As to Holmes, I observed that he sat frequently for half an hour on end with knitted brows and an abstracted air, but he swept the matter away with a wave of his hand when I mentioned it. Data, 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 he cried impatiently. I can't make bricks without clay. And yet he would always wind up by muttering that no sister of his should ever have accepted such a situation. The telegram which we eventually received came late one night, just as I was thinking of turning in, and Holmes was settling down to one of those all-night researches which he frequently indulged in, when I would leave him stooping over a retort and a test tube at night, and find him in the same position when I came down to breakfast in the morning. He opened the yellow envelope and then, glancing at the message, threw it across to me. Just look up the trains in Bradshaw, said he, and turned back to his chemical studies. The summons was a brief and urgent one. Please be at the Black Swan Hotel at Winchester at midday tomorrow. But Holmes shook his head gravely. Do you know, Watson, said he, that it is one of the curses of a mind with a turn like mine that I must look at everything with reference to my own special subject. You look at these scattered houses, and you are impressed by their beauty. I look at them, and the only thought which comes to me is a feeling of their isolation, and of the impunity with which crime may be committed there. Good heavens, I cried, who would associate crime with these dear old homesteads? They always fill me with a certain horror. It is my belief, Watson, founded upon my experience, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. You horrify me, but the reason is very obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the town what the law cannot accomplish. There is no lane so vile that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does does not beget sympathy and indignation among the neighbours. And then the whole machinery of justice is ever so close that a word of complaint can set it going, and there is but a step between the crime and the dock. But look at these lonely houses, each in its own fields, filled for the most part with poor ignorant folk who know little of the law. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness which may go on year in, year out in such places, and none the wiser. Had this lady who appeals to us for help gone to live in Winchester, I should never have had a fear for her. It is the five miles of country which makes the danger. Still, it is clear that she is not personally threatened. No, if she can come to Winchester to meet us, she can get away. Quite so, she has her freedom. What can be the matter, then? Can you suggest no explanation? I have devised seven separate explanations, each of which would cover the facts as far as we know them. But which of these is correct can only be determined by the fresh information which we shall no doubt find waiting for us. Well, there is the tower of the cathedral, and we shall soon learn all that Miss Hunter has to tell. The Black Swan is an inn of repute in the high street, at no distance from the station, and there we found the young lady waiting for us. She had engaged a sitting-room, and our lunch awaited us upon the table. "'I am so delighted that you have come,' she said earnestly. "'It is so kind of you both. But indeed I do not know what I should do. Your advice will be altogether invaluable to me. Pray tell us what has happened to you.' I will do so, and I must be quick, for I have promised Mr. Rucastle to be back before three. I got his leave to come into town this morning, though he little knew for what purpose. Let us have everything in its due order. Holmes thrust his long, thin legs out towards the fire, and composed himself to listen. In the first place, I may say that I have met, on the whole, 
with no actual ill-treatment from Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle. It is only fair to them to say that. But I cannot understand them, and I am not easy in my mind about them. What can you not understand? Their reasons for their conduct. But you shall have it all just as it occurred. When I came down, Mr. Rucastle met me here and drove me in his dog-cart to Copper Beaches. It is, as he said, beautifully situated, but it is not beautiful in itself, for it is a large square block of a house, whitewashed, but all stained and streaked with damp and bad weather. There are grounds round it, wood on three sides and on the fourth, a field which slopes down to the Southampton High Road which curves past about a hundred yards from the front door. This ground in front belongs to the house, but the woods all round are part of Lord Southerton's preserves. A clump of copper beeches immediately in front of the hall door has given its name to the place. I was driven over by my employer, who was as amiable as ever, and was introduced by him that evening to his wife and the child, they were waiting for me in the drawing-room, which is a very large room, stretching along the entire front of the house, with three long windows reaching down to the floor. A chair had been placed close to the central window, with its back turned towards it. In this I was asked to sit, and then Mr. Rucastle, walking up and down on the other side of the room, began to tell me a series of the funniest stories that I have ever listened to, you cannot imagine how comical he was, and I laughed until I was quite weary. Mrs. Rucastle, however, who has evidently no sense of humour, never so much as smiled, but sat with her hands in her lap and a sad, anxious look upon her face. After an hour or so, Mr. Rucastle suddenly remarked that it was time to commence the duties of the day, and that I might change my dress and go to little Edward in the nursery. Two days later this same performance was gone through under exactly similar circumstances. Again I changed my dress, again I sat in the window, and again I laughed very heartily at the funny stories of which my employer had an immense repertoire, and which he told inimitably. Then he handed me a yellow-backed novel, and moving my chair a little sideways, that my own shadow might not fall upon the page, he begged me to read aloud to him. I read for about ten minutes, beginning in the heart of the chapter, and then suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, he ordered me to cease and change my dress. You can easily imagine, Mr. Holmes, how curious I became as to what the meaning of this extraordinary performance could possibly be. She said nothing, but I am convinced that she had divined that I had a mirror in my hand and had seen what was behind me. She rose at once. Jeffro, said she, there is an impertinent fellow upon the road who stares up at Miss Hunter. No friend of yours, Miss Hunter, he asked. No, I know no one in these parts. Dear me, how very impertinent. Kindly turn round and motion him to go away. Surely it would be better to take no notice. No, no, we should have him loitering here always. Kindly turn round and wave him away like that. I did as I was told, and at the same instant Mrs. Rucastle drew down the blind. That was a week ago, and from that time I have not sat again in the window, nor have I worn the dress, nor seen the man in the road. Pray continue, said Holmes. Your narrative promises to be a most interesting one. You will find it rather disconnected, I fear and there may prove to be little relation between the first different incidents of which I speak. On the very first day that I was at Copper Beaches, Mr. Rucastle took me to a small outhouse which stands near the kitchen door. As we approached it I heard the sharp rattling of a chain, and the sound as of a large animal moving about. "'Look in here,' said Mr. Rucastle, showing me a slit between two planks, is he not a beauty? I looked through and was conscious of two glowing eyes, 
and of a vague figure huddled up on the darkness. Don't be frightened, said my employer, laughing at the start which I had given. It's only Carlo, my mastiff. I call him mine, but really old Toller, my groom, is the only man who can do anything with him. We feed him once a day, and not too much then, so that he is always as keen as mustard. Toller lets him loose every night, and God help the trespasser whom he lays his fangs upon. For goodness sake, don't you ever on any pretext set foot over the threshold at night, for it is as much as your life is worth. The warning was no idle one, for two nights later I happened to look out of my bedroom window about two o'clock in the morning. It was a beautiful moonlit night, and the lawn in front of the house was silvered over and almost as bright as day. A door which faced that which led into the quarters of the tallers opened into this suite, but it was invariably locked. One day, however, as I ascended the stair, I met Mr. Rucastle coming out through this door, his keys in his hand, and a look on his face which made him a very different person to the round, jovial man to whom I was accustomed. His cheeks were red, his brow was all crinkled with anger, and the veins stood out at his temples with passion. He locked the door and hurried past me without a word or a look. This aroused my curiosity, so when I went out for a walk in the grounds with my charge, I strolled round to the side from which I could see the windows of this part of the house. There were four of them in a row, three of which were simply dirty, while the fourth was shuttered up. They were evidently all deserted. As I strolled up and down, glancing at them occasionally, Mr. Rucastle came out to me, looking as merry and jovial as ever. Ah, said he, you must not think me rude if I passed you without a word, my dear young lady. I was preoccupied with business matters. I assured him that I was not offended. By the way, said I, you seem to have quite a suite of spare rooms up there, and one of them has the shutters up. Photography is one of my hobbies, said he. I have made my dark room up there. But dear me, what an observant young lady we have come upon. Who would have believed it? Who would have ever believed it? He spoke in a jesting tone, but there was no jest in his eyes as he looked at me. I read suspicion there and annoyance, but no jest. Well, Mr. Holmes, from the moment that I understood that there was something about that suite of rooms which I was not to know, I was all on fire to go over them. It was not mere curiosity, though I have my share of that. It was more a feeling of duty, a feeling that some good might come from my penetrating to this place. They talk of women's instinct. Perhaps it was woman's instinct which gave me that feeling. At any rate it was there, and I was keenly on the lookout for any chance to pass the forbidden door. It was only yesterday that the chance came. He overdid it. I was keenly on my guard against him. I was foolish enough to go into the empty wing, I answered, but it is so lonely and eerie in this dim light that I was frightened and ran out again. Oh, it is so dreadfully still in there. Only that, said he, looking at me keenly. Why, what do you think? I asked. Why do you think that I lock this door? I am sure that I do not know. It is to keep people out who have no business there. Do you see? He was still smiling in the most amiable manner. I'm sure if I had known, well then, you know now. And if you ever put your foot over that threshold again, here in an instant the smile hardened into a grin of rage, and he glared down at me with the face of a demon. I'll throw you to the mastiff. I was so terrified that I do not know what I did. I suppose that I must have rushed past him into my room. I remember nothing until I found myself lying on my bed trembling all over. Then I thought of you, Mr. Holmes. I could not live there longer without some advice. 
I was frightened of the house, of the man, of the woman, of the servants, even of the child. They were all horrible to me. If I could only bring you down, all would be well. Of course I might have fled from the house, but my curiosity was almost as strong as my fears. My mind was soon made up. I would send you a wire. I put on my hat and cloak, went down to the office, which is about half a mile from the house, and then returned, feeling very much easier. A horrible doubt came into my mind as I approached the door, lest the dog might be loose. But I remembered that Toller had drunk himself into a state of insensibility that evening, and I knew that he was the only one in the household who had any influence with the savage creature, or who would venture to set him free. I slipped in in safety, and lay awake half the night in my joy at the thought of seeing you. The man in the road was undoubtedly some friend of hers, possibly her fiancé, and no doubt, as you wore the girl's dress and were so like her, he was convinced from your laughter whenever he saw you, and afterwards from your gesture, that Miss Rucastle was perfectly happy and that she no longer desired his attentions. The dog is let loose at night to prevent him from endeavouring to communicate with her, so much is fairly clear. The most serious point in the case is the disposition of the child. What on earth has that to do with it? I ejaculated. My dear Watson, you as a medical man are continually gaining light as to the tendencies of a child by the study of the parents. Don't you see that the converse is equally valid? I have frequently gained my first real insight into the character of parents by studying their children. The child's disposition is abnormally cruel, merely for cruelty's sake. And whether he derives this from his smiling father, as I should suspect, or from his mother, it bodes evil for the poor girl who is in their power. I am sure that you are right, Mr. Holmes, cried our client. A thousand things come back to me which make me certain that you have hit it. Here are his keys, which are the duplicates of Mr. Rucastle's. You have done well indeed, cried Holmes with enthusiasm. Now lead the way, and we shall soon see the end of this black business. We passed up the stair, unlocked the door, followed on down a passage, and found ourselves in front of the barricade which Miss Hunter had described. Holmes cut the cord and removed the transverse bar. Then he tried the various keys in the lock, but without success. No sound came from within, and at the silence Holmes's face clouded over. I trust that we are not too late, said he. I think, Miss Hunter, that we had better go in without you. Now, Watson, put your shoulder to it, and we shall see whether we cannot make our way in. It was an old rickety door, and gave at once before our united strength. Together we rushed into the room. It was empty. There was no furniture save a little pallet bed, a small table, and a basket full of linen. The skylight above was open, and the prisoner gone. There has been some villainy here, said Holmes. This beauty has guessed Miss Hunter's intentions, and has carried his victim off. But how? Through the skylight. We shall soon see how he managed it. He swung himself up onto the roof. Ah, yes, he cried. Here's the end of a long light ladder against the eaves. That is how he did it. But it is impossible, said Miss Hunter. The ladder was not there when the Rue Castles went away. He has come back and done it. I tell you that he is a clever and dangerous man. I should not be very much surprised if this were he whose step I hear now upon the stair. I think, Watson, that it would be as well for you to have your pistol ready. The words were hardly out of his mouth before a man appeared at the door of the room, a very fat and burly man with a heavy stick in his hand. Miss Hunter screamed and shrunk against the wall at the sight of him. But Sherlock Holmes sprang forward and confronted him. You villain, said he, where's your daughter? The fat man cast his eyes round, and then up at the open skylight. 
It is for me to ask you that, he shrieked. You thieves, spies and thieves, I have caught you, have I? You are in my power. Mrs. Toller, cried Miss Hunter. Yes, miss. Mr. Rewcastle let me out when he came back before he went up to you. Ah, miss, it is a pity you didn't let me know what you were planning, for I would have told you that your pains were wasted. Ha! said Holmes, looking keenly at her. It is clear that Mrs. Toller knows more about this matter than anyone else. Yes, sir, I do, and I am ready enough to tell what I know. Then pray sit down and let us hear it, for there are several points on which I must confess that I am still in the dark. I will soon make it clear to you, said she, and I'd have done so before now if I could have got out from the cellar. If there's police court business over this, You'll remember that I was the one that stood your friend, and that I was Miss Alice's friend too. She was never happy at home, Miss Alice wasn't, from the time that her father married again. She was slighted like, and had no say in anything. But it never really became bad for her, until after she met Mr Fowler at a friend's house. As well as I could learn, Miss Alice had rights of her own by will, but she was so quiet and patient she was that she never said a word about them, but just left everything in Mr. Rewcastle's hands. He knew he was safe with her, but when there was a chance of a husband coming forward who would ask for all that the law could give him, then her father thought it time to put a stop on it. He wanted her to sign a paper so that whether she married or not, he could use her money. When she wouldn't do it, he kept on worrying her until she got brain fever and for six weeks was at death's door. Then she got better at last, all worn to a shadow and with her beautiful hair cut off. But that didn't make no change in her young man and he stuck to her as true as man could be. Ah, said Holmes, I think that what you have been good enough to tell us makes the matter fairly clear and that I can deduce all that remains. Mr. Rucastle, then, I presume, took to this system of imprisonment? Yes, sir. And brought Miss Hunter down from London in order to get rid of the disagreeable persistence of Mr. Fowler? That was it, sir. But Mr. Fowler, being a persevering man, as a good seaman should be, blockaded the house. And, having met you, succeeded by certain arguments metallic or otherwise, in convincing you that your interests were the same as his. Mr. Fowler was a very kind-spoken, free-handed gentleman, said Mrs. Toller serenely. And in this way he managed that your good man should have no want of drink, and that a ladder should be ready at the moment when your master had gone out. You have it, sir, just as it happened. I am sure we owe you an apology, Mrs. Toller, said Mr. Holmes, for you have certainly cleared up everything which puzzled us. And here comes the country surgeon and Mrs. Rucastle. So I think, Watson, that we had best escort Miss Hunter back to Winchester, as it seems to me that our locus standi now is rather a questionable one. And thus was solved the mystery of the sinister house with the copper beeches in front of the door. They still live with their old servants, who probably know so much of Rucastle's past life that he finds it difficult to part from them. As to Miss Violet Hunter, my friend Holmes, rather to my disappointment, manifested no further interest in her when once she had ceased to be the centre of one of his problems, and she is now the head of a private school in Warsaw, where I believe that she has met with considerable success. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.